Cool. So the man, the vision, and the plan. Yeah. What an interesting uh title. Then we're gonna get into why we have that title in a second. But whenever I do a presentation on the life and legacy of the most eminent prophet, as we call him, Marcus Mazaya Garvey, um, and the UNIA ACL, I have to give honor to these two great individuals. The first being Mama Amy Jakes Garvey, who sorry that I've I've made a mistake here. You know when you, when you forget to change your copy and paste. Anyway, um, who is the second wife of Marco Mazai Garvey and was one, his personal secretary. Um, and then Baba Tony Martin, who is the foremost scholar on the life and legacy of Marcus Mazai Garvey and the UNIA ACO. The reason why I always begin these presentations or these series by honouring these two people is because these are the people to whom we are most indebted in terms of knowledge and information being preserved about Marcus Mazai Garvey and the UNIA ACL. Um, obviously, Mama Amy J. Garvey is responsible for compiling um, the philosophies and opinions of Marcus Mazai Garvey, volumes one, two, and three. Um, and also, um, or should I say, philosophies and opinions of Marcus Garvey, volumes one and two, and then more philosophies and opinions of Marcus Mazai Garvey. And also Garvey and Garveyism. She's written a number um, of other texts, which I'll go into later. But suffice to say that following the passing of Marcus Mazai Garvey in 1940, many scholars did a hit job on his life and legacy. And it's like they either were attempting to remove his name and the name of the UNIA ACL from history, or distort the legacy and distort the name. And so it was the efforts principally of Mama Amy Jakes Garvey, who um, in writing and preserving the philosophies and opinions and writing uh, Garvey and Garveyism, who kept the true legacy of Marcus Mosiah Garvey and the UNIA ACL out there. And then in 1970s, a man called Tony Martin came about and wrote a book called Race First, which basically revolutionized Garvey scholarship. This put, set a lot of people right in terms of the true legacy um, of Marcus Mosiah Garvey and the UNIA ACL. And so I always give honor and praise to these great ancestors. Baba Tony Martin is a man that um, I had the, the, the pleasure of meeting and working with many, many times. Yeah? We hosted him a couple of times at the Archibald and Revivalist Movement. Um, we met him at Africa Liberation Day as hosted by the Pan-African Congress Movement. And so, yeah, man, just honor to Baba uh, Tony Martin. And if you want a, beginners, um, a beginning in terms of getting into the Garvey legacy, I would suggest this book, Race First, or another of his books, which is smaller. One second. Wait there. Wait, God. Oh, I can't see it. All right. It's called, I'm sure I'll see it in a, in a second. It's called Marcus Garvey Hero. But it's basically a condensed version of this one right here. All right. So those are two books that I suggest for anybody who wants to begin to get into the legacy of Marcus Mazzai Garvey and the UNIA ACL. Okay. Moving forward, kings and queens. Overstanding Garveyism. This is, these are the words of my father um, in the whirlwind newspaper. And he says, Garveyism is a sum total of the life and legacy of the most eminent prophet and king, his excellency, Marcus Mazaya Garvey. It is the whole manifestation of the man, the vision, and the plan. Um, and this is Brother Lee Van Dakar, my dad, uh, speaking in the whirlwind, the issue of the whirlwind um, number six. Yeah. Now, the, the reason why this is here at the beginning, obviously, it explains the title, the man, the vision, and the plan. So we're going to be explaining some key points in terms of the life of Marcus Mazai Garvey himself. We're going to be exploring the vision uh, that was enacted or manifested through the vehicle of the Universal Negro Improvement Association and the African Communities League, and also um, how they went about actualizing the vision. What was the plan? OK, um, and the reason why we look at the man is because the man was central to the vision and the plan uh, and not just the man, but the people. Yeah, the man was an embodiment of the people in that he was in leadership. Um, and so we focus not only on Marcus Mosiah Garvey, the individual, but the, 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 the manifestation of the people, the organization who put the plan into action. But we look at the man in particular because he was in leadership and embodied so much of the characteristics, so much of the, of, of, of the, of the, the, the mentality and the mindset to bring that plan into action. And he sacrificed so much and achieve so much in his life in his life and so we were taught in the al kibla revivalist movement now when we're studying our greats when we're studying our movements when we're studying our leaders and we're studying our ancestors we don't just study them uh, abstractly uh in the sense of thus and so forth was born on this date and did this on that date 
and th there was this event that happened in history. We're looking at them as people, as human beings. What kind of character did they need to embody, to manifest in order to achieve what they achieved? What kind of sacrifices did they have to make in order to achieve what they achieve? What kind of characteristics, therefore, do we need to embody and develop in ourselves in order to build upon the legacy of these greats? What kinds of mistakes did they make that we need to now correct and not repeat? And what, and most importantly, because sometimes we, we, we focus on correcting the mistakes, but not replicating the successes. Yeah. So what kind, what successes did they have that we need to learn from and build on in terms of being successful in our day uh, and time? And so this is why this is called the man, the vision, and uh, the plan. All right, kings and queens. So we're going to go forward right about now and delve into some, you know, facts in terms of the life of Malcolm Azai Garvey very, very briefly. All right. Um, first of all, you need to know that Mark of Mosiah Garvey was born on the 17th of the month of Mosiah, the eighth month of the year, what we previously called August, to Sarah Jane and Marcus Garvey Sr. in St. Anne's, Jamaica. And we want to just say big up to Jamaica today, bruh. Um, but yeah, the African experience in Jamaica is, 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 is a beautiful, beautiful um, and painful experience because much of it is, you know, delve deep into the heart of the enslavement experience. However, um, today is also International Reggae Day, um, you know what I'm saying, as designated by our people in Jamaica. And so we just want to honour the legacy of Africans in Jamaica because the Jamaican culture is an African culture, little as it's known. And shout out and big respect uh, to the indigenous peoples of uh, Jamaica as well who were there before we came, okay? Um, at age 14, yeah, um, Malcolm Mazai Garvey became an apprentice to his godfather, Mr. Alfred Burroughs, yes, in a printing firm. This is important because this uh, printing trade would follow him throughout the rest of um, his life. But it begins with his godfather, Mr. Alfred Burroughs, okay? Um, and at age 16, he moved to Kingston, the capital of Jamaica, and earned uh, an employment at the P.A. Benjamin Printery. He became a foreman in just two years. And this is a monumental feat, yeah, um, at, um, for Marcus Mosiah Garvey. If you understand anything about Jamaican society, especially at that time, we're dealing with the colonial times now, whereby color stratification, colorism was uh, basically a social indicator in terms of your economic and social mobility, okay? It was very unusual to find dark-skinned Africans in positions of note, in positions of leadership. And so the, the fact that Marco Mazai Garvey, as a very, very dark-skinned man, was able to achieve this at age 16 is a testament to his brilliance, okay? Um, and he actually begins his activism during this period. In response to low pay and pay, poor working conditions, Mark of Mazai Garvey led a strike, yes, on behalf of the workers at the PA Benjamin Printery, okay? That young, yeah? Um, then during this time, he begins his activism. He becomes connected with Pan-Africanist Dr. Robert Love and joined the National Club. The National Club was an, an organization founded by Dr. Robert Love um, that was challenging uh, the British colonialism uh, in uh, Jamaica. Just a quick note on Dr. Robert Love. He, um, as you can see, his dates there, 1839 to 1912. Um, he's a Pan-Africanist and a journalist. He's the co-founder of the National Club. Uh, he was a Jegna, yeah? Um, one of the, the people that was teaching. Jegna is a Amhadic terminology relating to those who uh, stand in the position of, of teaching, yeah? We often use it in the African-centered circles to replace the term uh, mentor, because mentor has a, a very, very, um, the, uh, what's the word? Um, <laughs> I, I, the, the word is slipping me. But if you look at the origin of the term mentor as it relates to Greek mythology, then you realize that we need to do away with that, that terminology. I won't go into that right about now, but we use the term Jegna to replace it, okay? To my Papa Garvey at a young age, and Papa Garvey said that it was Dr. Robert Love who gave him much of his early education uh, in race consciousness. Uh, um, Dr. Robert Love was a founder and editor of the Jamaican Advocate, a newspaper, um, and basically that was used yeah, to organize people against uh, British colonialism. 
And he supported Henry Sylvester Williams in the Pan-African Conference in 1900. Pan-African Conference in 1900 is the conference that, that people mark the birth of the term Pan-Africanism from, yeah? So um, Dr. Robert Love, was, he wasn't at the conference, but he was involved in it through his correspondence with um, Henry Sylvester Williams and also organized with Henry Sylvester Williams um, and set up a branch of the Pan-African Association um, in Jamaica uh, in concert with Henry Sylvester Williams when Henry Sylvester Williams visited uh, Jamaica. So get to know that Marcus Messiah Garvey did not just come in a vacuum, yes? Um, he was um, feasting off the wellspring of those who came uh, before him also. And we'll, we'll get into a few more of those as we go forward in the presentation, yeah? Uh, we like to we like to emphasize this fact that Mark Mazar government is this pop out of nowhere, okay? There were people that invested in him, right? And, and I should say, uh, before I go any further, that um, just to explain the importance of his mother and his father, um, his, his mother... Let me, do, let me start with his father. His father was responsible for really developing uh, his character in terms of his strength of character, in terms of his steely um, and, and die-hard personality. His father was also responsible for developing his intellect because he had a, a, a relatively significant library in his home. And his father used to encourage him uh, to read from uh, that library, which is unusual for an African in Jamaica during that time. His father was a stonemason um, and used to bring Marcus Messiah Garvey, a young Marcus Messiah Garvey, along in that craft and taught him many lessons um, and in many harsh lessons as well um, in that regard. One famous story that we heard from Mama Amy Jace Garvey is that one day, uh, while they were digging um, a grave, yeah, um, as a stonemason, Papa Garvey's father, Marcus Garvey Sr., used to dig grave and build tombstones. And so they were digging this grave um, and, you know, they were in the grave and Papa uh, Marcus Garvey Sr. walked up the ladder and took the ladder up and left his son in the grave, Marcus Garvey, in the grave for hours, yeah? And when he came back, yeah, he asked Marcus Garvey, he said, boy, did you cry out? And Marcus Garvey said, no, sir. And he said, did you make a fuss and a big fuss in the night? And Marcus Garvey said, no, sir. And so he said, um, and so Ma Amy James Garvey said that Marcus Garvey Sr. told Marcus Garvey Jr., um, that that's to show you that there's that, they, that you have nothing to fear, there's nothing to be scared of. There's no such thing as duppies and ghosts. Another lesson that Marcus Garvey Sr. also taught Marcus Mazai Garvey, his son, um, was that uh, he's supposed to call no man master, call no man master. And the person who we who was calling master at that time was the white man, kings and queens. And so that's some lessons there. And then also, uh, Mama Sarah Jane Garvey. Papa Garvey describes her um, as being too good for the time that she lived in. She was a very, very kind uh, person, a, very, a, a person who would give to the community that was around her. She would give her a last. And so in Marcus Messiah Garvey Sr. Uh, developed um, the, 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 the kind of strength of character in terms of determination, the steely character of Marcus Messiah Garvey and Sarah Jane Garvey develop the more softer side the, the caring side um i say softer like that's probably the wrong word but the caring side that the side that um that w looked at the condition of the people of his people that were around him the side of him that wanted to do for his community was developed um in mark of Isaiah garvey by uh, his mother and the work that she used to do uh in the community and so that's very very important uh, that we know these things. Going forward, Marco Messiah Garvey traveled throughout the Caribbean, South and Central America from 1910 to 1912. His activism continues because he was sought, um, um, he sought employment and again led strikes and petitions on behalf of African workers. So he did this. Um, he was one of those who was working on the Panama Canal um, during this time. Yeah, won't go into the history of that, but it's very, very deep. Um, and um, he also led strikes in Costa Rica, um, you know what I'm saying, um, during this time as well, against poor working conditions. And in fact, in Costa Rica, this is important because, because he was in middle management, yeah? And so the, the bosses that, that, that he was working for um, offered him, you know, some goods and some trinkets and, and, and an elevated position 
um, if he did not lead the strike on behalf of the workers in relation to low pay and poor working conditions. And um, uh, the workers themselves actually nominated and came to Marco Mazai Garvey and asked him to lead the strike against the workers. And he sided with the workers who were his subordinates uh, in that regard against his superiors in that regard. Yeah, very, very important uh, to note. All right. 1912 to 1914, he traveled throughout Britain and Europe. Um, he studied law at Burbeck University, yeah, um, uh, during this time in London, um, where were they right now? Um, and because of the fact that there were students here from West Africa in particular, and organized students as well, through them, he learned about um, the Africa and what was taking place in Africa and the, the nature of colonialism uh, in Africa. During this time, he meets noted Pan-Africanist of this era, um, Deuce Muhammad Ali, a brother from Sudan and Egypt, respectively. Um, and he wrote for the magazine, the African Times and Orient Review, as in Mark Mazai Garvey wrote for the African Times and Orient Review. Uh, a little note on Deuce Muhammad Ali, as I said, he's from, um, he was born, in, he came in, in Egypt, but um, his uh, mother is from Sudan, okay? Um, and um, let me yeah, let me go forward. But just to say, just to make the point that the, the, the African Times and Orient Review was actually a hub for a lot of the great Pan-Africanists of that era. And so Marco Mazai Garvey, in writing for that publication, was being exposed to the work of Baba um, Martin Delaney and Edward Wilmot Blyden, um, Henry Sylvester Williams, uh, uh, Kaisley Hayford, yeah, um, and others, yeah, kings and queens, all right? So... Very important that to note that in terms of his now Pan-African education was being developed uh, around these times, all right? So, in the words of Mark of Mazaya Garvey, as spoken in an article that he wrote in 1923 called The Negro's Greatest Enemy, he states, I started to make an, take an interest in the politics of my country, and then I saw the injustices done to my race because it was black. I went traveling to South and Central America to find out if it was the if it was so elsewhere, and I found the same situation. I sailed to Europe and again found the same stumbling block. You are black. So this is now Marcus Mazai Garvey explaining that he actually was traveling in order to study the condition of African people, black people around the world. And uh, we have to send an honor to his big sister, Sister Indiana, because she funded a lot of these uh, a lot of his traveling, yeah, that he was doing uh, around this time, as well as, you know, him working to, to fund his own travels. But his sister, Indiana, was also instrumental to, to his development uh, during this time, okay? And I read of the conditions in America. I read Up From Slavery by Booker T. Washington and then my doom, if I may call it, if, I'm, if I may so call it, of being a race leader dawned upon me in London after I had traveled through almost half of Europe, yeah? And so obviously he's studying all this and then in London is when basically he realized he had to take up some kind of uh, a, a leadership position in terms of alleviating uh, these circumstances. So he continues. I asked, where is the black man's government? Where are his king? Where is his king and kingdom? Where is his president, his country and his ambassadors? his army, his navy, his men of big affairs. I could not find them. And then I said, and then I declared, I will help to make them, yeah? So bearing in mind now, this is him, uh, tr you know, traveling back to Jamaica from London, UK, yeah? And this vision comes into his head. He's, and the vision is based upon these questions. Where is the black man government? Where is his king? Yes? Where is his president? And his kingdom and his country and his ambassador and his army and his navy and his men and women of bigger fears. I could not find them. And then I declared I will help to make them. Notice the use of the word help. He realized that he was in a, a collective effort from early. But the vision was already big. The vision was not, was not um, where are his, his black politicians in Britain or his black politicians in America. That's not what his, the vision was. The vision was not where are um, you know his 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 black millionaires, yes. Where 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 is the first black man to be uh, you know uh, elected to the cabinet, yeah, or the Congress? 
that's not where is the first black captain of a steamship? That was not um Marco Mazzaia Garvey's vision. It was where is the black man government and king and kingdom, president and country. Yes. These are institutions of society, kings and queens. So you can see that the, the vision was na nationhood from the very beginning. All right. So in relation to this, when Malcolm Mazai Garvey travels back to Jamaica, he forms the Universal Negro Improvement Association and African Communities League. It's actually an abbreviation of the full um, title, which had words like imperial and conservation and all them something there. But abbreviated, it was the Universal Negro Improvement Association and African Communities League. Um, UNIA uh, ACL and um, it's the, the wording is very interesting um, partly because there's a there's a man by the name of um, Sylvian Binatu who was um, a, a Pan-Africanist from Haiti um, and he had um, I'm forgetting the name of the organization it was Universal Something Association yeah but it was a Pan-African organization and so some people suggest that um, Marco Mazai Garvey was inspired by uh, ancestor Sylvian um, uh, uh, in the in the forming of this title, but you, we see the term Negro in there and African, yes, Universal Negro Improvement Association and African Communities League, yes, um, and Marco Bazar Garvey often used to say African Communities League of the World, and so we see what the intentions were, yeah, already, all right, it was to improve us. Um, from the condition that we were in and form an African Communities League. Notice the title, Communities League. And then if we go by Marco Mazai Garvey using the terms like of the world, the vision was already uh, international. So the, the, the intention was to improve our standard of living at, in, every, at every, in every facet, yeah? in every stage of life, uh, in every area of human activity, everywhere that we were on the planet Earth, and form us into an African Communities League of the world. We cannot speak about the beginning of the UNIA ACO without honouring the name Mama, Queen Mama, Amy Ashwood Garvey, because she was a founding member of the UNIA ACO. When Marco Bazaya Garvey started the UNIA ACO, the first meeting was actually held in the living room of the mother of Mama Amy Ashwood Garvey. Um, Mama Amy Ashwood uh, became the first wife of Marco Mazaya Garvey. She um, was a lifelong um, Pan-Africanist and activist even after uh, they separated. Um, and much of her activism actually took place in the United Kingdom. Yeah, she's very, very instrumental um, in activism in the United Kingdom during this period. Um, and we honor her as well because she was actually so like things like the mangrove nine in the uk she was involved in um when um the fifth pan-african congress was held in manchester she actually chaired the first session of the pan-african congress um yes kings and queens and so you know very very important that we know about the life and the legacy of mama amy ashwood uh garvey all right and so we go forward uh with the vision of the UNIA ACL. Marco Mazai Garvey continues, it is for me to inform you that the Universal Negro Improvement Association is an organization that seeks to unite into one solid body, the 400 million Africans of the world. And I've, you've got Africans in bracket because where, where I put Africans, he says um, Negroes, yeah, of the world. To link up the 15 million Africans of the United States of America with the 30 million Africans of the West Indies, the 40 million Africans of South and Central America, with the 280 million Africans of Africa for the purpose of furthering our industrial, commercial, educational, social and political conditions. Yeah. So the first thing that we need to note here is that um, the designated um, number of Africans as estimated at that time was 400 million. Some people question whether Marco Mazai Garvey's mathematics were correct. It's not particularly important. What you need to understand is that Marco Mazai Garvey was talking about whole, the whole are we? Everybody, everywhere. All Africans on the planet Earth, yes? And many people use the term back to African movement um, uh, to, to describe the, the, um, the UNIA or the Garvey movement. Eh, yeah, many Garvey have a problem with the terminology. However... Um, what Marco Mazai Garvey himself said, it was about unifying us to further our industrial, commercial, educational, social and political conditions. So wherever we were, 
we had to further our own conditions wherever we were and in doing so had to link up do it as an organized body uh, of people okay bear this in mind kings and queens all right so the unia develops at its height we're talking about between some say now the, the, the often the highest estimates that you're going to find are six million in most books yeah um Marco Bazai Garvey in more philosophies and opinions posited that it was 11 million and then jo Baba John Henry Clark said for, for all of the official branches there were unofficial branches so you have to you have to add on a couple million yeah <laughs> what's it called um whatever the official figures are you have to add on a couple million yeah so I, I go in the middle when I say all right let's let's call it um, 11 million um uh, members yeah um around the world that's over 1,000 branches in over 14, 40 countries. The UNIA developed two shipping companies. Most people only know about one, but there was two. Um, a nursing agency, paramilitary defense and security units, that should say, because there was more than one. Wholesale retail manufacturing uh, businesses, schools and universities, newspapers and magazines, and also an international de industrial development program. Yeah. And so we're going to explain this is just an overview. And we're going to explain it further right about now. Bigging up the chat, bigging up everybody in the chat. Um, do stay tuned. I'm going to be coming to um, to you in a second, yeah, when we open up for Q&A and discussion, all right? So first and foremost, yes? So I'm, I'm giving you the overview. Now I'm going to delve into some of the details, okay? W what I'm going to go into now, each section could be a presentation in and of itself, yeah? Or we're just going to touch on certain and certain things, okay? So we begin by looking at the Negro Factories Corporation, all right? This is a certificate um, to to un to, of stock, yes? Uh, when you receive this, it means that you have bought shares in the Negro Factories Corporation, okay? Um, and uh, so basically what we're emphasizing here is that the Negro Factories Corporation was uh, a business or uh, a business made up of businesses that was owned by the African people of peoples of the world because they bought the stocks and shares uh, in the, the corporation in order to see it uh, manifest itself. And so the term corporation would, could actually be replaced by the term cooperative because essentially when you delve into the Negro Factories Corporation, it's operated as a cooperative. And I'm making that point because many people put out this fallacy um, that Marcus Garvey was a capitalist and this is supposed to be a stain uh, on the Garvey legacy. Uh, I'm developing a presentation called Was Marcus Garvey a Capitalist that we're going to delve into. It's not finished yet, and I won't finish it before the month of Messiah, which is why it's not in this series. But we have to delve into it. Yeah, we have to delve into it um, and go in, a, you know, the economics of the UNIA ACL to challenge that particular misconception. OK, um, however, going forward now, check the levels. Yeah, check the levels. Under the Negro Factories Corporation, you had grocery stores, you had laundrettes, you had printing press, you had restaurants, you had hotels, you had a trucking company, you had farms, kings and queens, yeah? Also, the, the Negro Factories Corporation was manufacturing black dolls. They were tailoring suits. They were making dresses. They were making hats. They were printing books. They had a printing press, as I've said, kings and queens. All right. And as a result, the Negro Factories Corporation employed over a thousand black people in Harlem alone. For those of us who are listening, living in the UK, this is the equivalent of black people or more importantly, a black organization a black power organization employing over a thousand black people in Brixton, let's say. Imagine that Brixton was a hub of black business and entrepreneurship, cooperative black business and entrepreneurship to the extent that over a thousand African people are employed by it, by the cooperative in one borough in London. Imagine, yeah, that's the levels, kings and queens. Not only that, but um, the, 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 the Negro Factories Corporation, so during the 1920s, it, the, the chairperson of the Negro Factories Corporation was a brother by the name of Ulysses Poston, yeah? Um, and Ulysses Poston 
as the chairperson of the Negro Fascist Corporation, actually gave um, advice, business advice, to other black businesses in Harlem that did not come under the auspices of the Negro Fascist Corporation. Other businesses in Harlem, black businesses, actually sought for the Negro Fascist Corporation and Ulysses Poston for loans, yes, in order to develop business um, and to save some businesses, okay? So let it be known that in this at this point, yeah, the, the premier black nationalist organization was also the premier um, uh, uh, African formation in terms of economics, business, and entrepreneurship. The, the, the community at large was seeking the expertise of the Pan-African organization in terms of developing and conducting business. Yes? Why well, you have to know that. Yeah? Note that. So when you look at uh, black business theory and ideology in this day and age, note that a lot of these people are feasting off of uh, the black nationalist movement, even though nowadays they tell us that the black nationalist movement don't know how to do business. Yeah. All right. So let's bear that in mind. Most people know. Um, oh, by the way, I, I also want to point out here that we're dealing with production. Yes. Manufacturing and production. We're dealing with distribution and we are dealing with retail. Importantly, the UNIA owned farms. They were growing their own produce. They were, they, were, they were transporting it themselves and they were selling it themselves. Yes, and I should say ourselves because I'm a member of the UNIA ACO. Yeah, all right. Division 304, Mazai Division 304 coming out of London, UK. Brap, brap. Okay, all right. The Black Star Line, most people, uh, when you know about Marco Mazai Garvey, you know about the Black Star Line. Yes, the Black Star Line, Kings and Queens. His most, uh, the, the most famous initiative of the UNIA ACO, the Black Star Line um, bought uh, uh, three ships, was in the process of buying a fourth, yes, and, um, and then when the Black Star Line folded, uh, it was replaced by the Black Cross Navigation uh, Company, uh, and they bought two ships, yeah, so effectively six ships, yeah, uh, were, were commandeered and, and put on the seas by the UNIA uh, ACL, okay, this was advertising put out there by the UNIA when they purchased this uh, ship called the Yarmouth. And the, the, the Black Star Line did actually um, uh, begin the process of um, developing, connecting up the African world through industry, yes, and trade. And so goods, yeah, um, you know, fruits and vegetables were transported throughout the Americas via Black Star Line ships. And even alcohol, but there's a there's a um, there's a, a contentious story as regards to the alcohol, you know, because it was during the time of pro when, when prohibition was going to come into play, and one of the um, and I believe it might have been Cockburn because you know Cockburn fell out of grace with the UNIA because of some of his chicanery, all right. Um, but he was um, they put you know th th this image of a black captain of a of a black owned ship was put out there, and Papa Garvey himself says that the the, the membership doubled and tripled, yeah after they put this out there, that there was a, a black organization, a Pan-African revolutionary organization that owned a ship and it was captained by an African, okay? And so people say that the, the, the Black Star Line was designed you know, to transport black people from you know, the Americas to Africa. Yes, that was one of the plans, um, but more importantly, it was about developing international trade and commerce uh, across the African diaspora, okay? Um, and so that's very, very important. All right. Um, and also the Black Star Line was funded by the people. Yeah. People were buying shares of five dollars. And so there was no individual owned the Black Star Line Steamship Corporation. Um, it was chaired um, um, by a, a, a mama who I'm going to mention later. So I won't say her name now. But it was owned by the African people of the world. Yes. OK. It's very, very, very important to note that all right then now you have the Afri the universal african legion yeah also known as the african legion there this was the paramilitary the principal par paramilitary organ or auxiliary of the unia aco this was basically now we're talking about a time yeah in which uh this is the jim crow era lynching was rife yeah throughout the united states of america um in particular um, and um, and I've neglected to mention that 
Markham Isaiah Garvey begins the, the UNIA in 1914. It's 1916 that he travels to um, the United States of America. And then in 1918, the, the headquarters is moved from the, the, uh, U, the from Jamaica to the USA. Um, and so much of the activity, the heyday of the UNIA ACL takes, is, is you know, developed when Markham Isaiah Garvey is in the USA. So we have this era now of Jim Crow, the Ku Klux Klan, whereby Africans are being killed, yes, uh, in the thousands every year, okay? Um, and who not get killed, get brutalized. And who not get brutalized, well, and including in brutalization is rape, yeah, of African women. And so the, um, the Universal African Legion is there now to protect the people. The Universal African Legion is, provides a security at all UNIA ACL uh, events. It takes part in parades. And it also um, had to protect the people from the Ku Klux Klan and the police. There's a famous incident whereby the police who used to raid Liberty Halls, which was UNIA headquarters in various different cities, in, in um, it, it was it Tennessee, in 1927, tried to raid a Liberty Hall um, and, in, and when they got to the Liberty Hall, the, the, the brothers of the Universal African Legion basically posted up um, and the police opened fire. The legionnaires shot back. Um, there were casualties on both sides um, and these kinds of things, kings and queens. The UNIA ACL, the, the Universal African Legion also got into shootouts with uh, the, um, the, uh, the Ku Klux Klan, yeah, as well. And there was propaganda. <laughs> going around uh, the colonial administrations, yeah, Britain in particular, that this black man called Mark of Isaiah Garvey was going to send an army of black men, yeah, uh, to, to Africa and kick out the colonizers, yeah. And in, in at least one place, this, this resulted in a mass um, uprising uh, in Congo, all right, uh, at least things, things increased. But yeah, that's another story for another time. We're just, we're just a touch and move, yeah, we're just a touch and move, okay. Then now we have the universal African. Motor Corps, yeah, which was the military wing of the UNIA ACL that was exclusively membered by women. In other words, the women of the UNIA ACL had a military auxiliary exclusive to African women. They were militarily trained, yeah? I want you to know that. Yes, this is in the 19-teens and the 1920s. Yes, okay. So the, U the women of the UNIA were providing security um, as well um, and were militarily um, trained kings and queens. It's, it's very important that we know, um, um, and we're going to go into this in a second, about the woman leadership of the UNIA. So this, these are the women of the Universal African Motor Corps in parade in Harlem in the 1920s, okay? You have the Universal Black Cross Nurses, um, and the full title is the Universal African Black Cross Nurses, yeah? Um, and this was arguably the most active auxiliary of the UNIA ACL. The Black Cross Nurses um, provided, um, as the, 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 the name suggests, healthcare, yes, uh, for the African world. And, and so you had branches of the Black Cross. It's the most active branch. So it was in the United States. It was throughout the Americas. It was on the African continent. And they were, they were providing not only health care, but also um, health information. Yeah. So in the 1920s, I, I was watching a, um, a drama by the name of Boardwalk Empire some time ago. And in the drama, they, they depict a woman trying to go to the doctor and get information on prenatal and postnatal care, um, on women's health in general. And uh, the doctors, the, the hospitals didn't provide that information. Clinics didn't provide that information. They were not publishing uh, documents on women's health. Well, the UNIA ACL, the women of the Universal African Black Cross Nurses were doing that in the 1920s. I'm, I'm emphasizing that because Boardwalk Empire is set in the 1920s in Chicago, yes? So they were providing information on herbs, yes, and remedies for different sicknesses, for childcare, childbirth. Um, they, they had a midwifery service, yes. And not only that, they were actually, um, they, they had a training program 
for nurses in the in, in the sorry to develop nurses within the UNIA, and you could only get a uniform once you had completed the program. Yes, so not only were they providing healthcare, they were providing training for Africans who wanted to get into healthcare. Yeah, it's extremely important stuff. All right, so. Um, the women of the UNIA ACL, some say between 50 and 60% of the organization was women. Um, but the, the Black Cross nurses, as I've said, was the most uh, active of uh, the auxiliaries of the UNIA ACL. And as I talk about the Black Cross nurses, I have to hail up the name of the Honorable Lady Henrietta Vintan Davis. Yeah, uh, a great, 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 great African woman who by trade, was a creative, was an act actress, a playwright, a poet, and an elocutionist. Um, she was the international organizer, yes, of the UNIA ACL, okay? So she was operating in the highest ranks of the organization. She was also, at, at one point, the second vice president general of the UNIA ACL. She was the director of the Black Star Line Steamship Corporation, and she was the lead organizer um, of the Black Cross nurses who I've just mentioned, yeah? So she was at the helm of the Black Cross nurses. She actually traveled around the Americas, setting up branches of the Black Cross nurses in different countries um, throughout the Caribbean, throughout South and Central America, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and she was also one of the co-signatories to the Declaration of Rights of the, of the Negro Peoples of the World, which I will get into in a second, so I won't go into that right about now. Um, but Marcus Mosiah Garvey himself described Mama Henrietta Vinton Davis as the greatest gift to the Negro race. Yeah. Um, and so we, we honor Mama Henrietta Vinton Davis as a woman organizer, a woman leader in the UNIA ACL. But she wasn't alone in terms of women leadership. Many times it is said that um, in black history, the history is often told through the eyes of men, that the men are often more prominent in the history than uh, the women. And I've said, and I've yet to hear anybody um, refute this, uh, that I, 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 I'm suggesting that the UNIA ACL is a, an, a, 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 an exception to that rule, yeah? Because other than Marcus Mazaya Garvey himself, the more prominent names associated with the UNIA ACL are women in the UNIA ACL. We mentioned Mama Amy Jakes Garvey earlier. We've mentioned Mama Amy Ashwood Garvey. Oh, but Shakara, those were the wives of Marcus Messiah Garvey. So they are mentioned in as much as they were the wives of Marcus Messiah Garvey. Yes. So I right, fine, we get that. Okay, so we can talk about then. Um, well, let's let's go forward. We could talk about Amy. Yeah, so we've got Amy Jakes Garvey already. Yeah. Now bearing in mind, yeah, that Amy Jakes Garvey was um secretary general in the UNIA ACL. All right. Sorry, she was actually the personal secretary and worked in the, sec the secretary general. Yeah, personal secretary of Martha Mazaya Garvey. She was the editor of a section of the UNIA's newspaper. Yes, the Negro World called Our Women and What They Think. Yes. So the UNIA newspaper, the Negro World, had a section that was de 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 dedicated to profiling the views and the opinions of the women of the race. Yes. OK. She edit she's the editor of the first and opinions of Marcus Mazar Garvey, as I said before. Um, she co-edits Marcus Garvey and the Vision of Africa with Barbara John Henry Clark. And she's also the author of her own works. A memorandum cor cor sorry, correlative of Africa, West Indies, and the Americas, Garvey and Garveyism, and Black Power in America, the Power of the Human Spirit, all of which are written um, after Mark and Mazai Garvey's passing. But she's a prolific um, writer in, in her own right, Mama Amy Jakes Garvey is. Um, and many of her essays are housed in this book by Queen Mother and Zinga Asata. Yeah, powerful, powerful mama activist from um, living in the UK called Women and the Garvey Movement. Yeah, it contains full uh, reprints of the articles of Mama Amy uh, Jakes Garvey. And we're going to get a snippet of why name a little bit later on. OK, all right. So then we have Queen Mama Mariam Samad. We have to honor her because Mama Mariam Samad was born in the Garvey Movement. In fact, she was born 
um during the month during in, um in September, but her mother went into labor while she was at the UNIA convention, yes, of 1922. And when she went into labor, she went to Huolan, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mama Mario and somebody tell this story. She held on because she wanted to hear Marco Bazai Gali finish his speech, right? And when he's done, she get rushed to the hospital and, and be the barn, yeah? Came up a Marianne Samad, born in the UNIA, and became one of the women that kept the Garvey name alive, the UNIA name alive, throughout her life. She only died last year, kings and queens, yeah? At the age of 95? Something between 95... Hold on, let me get this. I can't... Yeah, I can't remember the, um, the full... Because I'm, I'm trying to get... Yeah, when... Eh, anyway, I can't remember the full... Because, um, yeah, it was on the cost of her birthday, so... But going into this Kings and Queens, she was born and raised lifelong Gavayat. She developed the Sankore Nubian Cultural Center. This is all now after Papa Garvey's passing. She was an activist in the Black Power movement yeah, in America during this time. Yeah. Um, she she's credited with the creation of the word and the fashion sense dashiki. So when you look at the, the, the dashiki becoming the fashion sense of the black power movement, Mama Mariam Samad is credited with being the initiator, or at least one of the initiators of that um, movement, yeah? And this is taken from an article that is written by one of her biographers, and the name is slipping me of the biographer, you know? But he interviewed her, and, she's, and she said this to him. I realised the way I dressed in Harlem was different. No matter what, I always looked different, and I realised that clothes were a political statement. Uh, a political statement. You had some fluffy-haired uh, woman whose clothes are a fashion statement. But to me, they are much more. I don't give a damn whether you like the way I dressed or not, but it was a political statement. And always my clothes told you by the late 50s and early 60s that I was an African, yeah? So she began to learn. There were students traveling to the USA from the continent. Um, um, and her father also lived in, in, on the continent for some time. And they were teaching her about styles of dress and fashion um, in, in Mama Africa. Obviously, the, the term dashiki is derived from the term danshiki, and they evolved their own versions of it, yeah? Or we evolved our own versions of it in the Americas during this time, okay? So we want to honor Mama Mariam Samad. Um, then, then there are others, yeah? Mitty Moore Lena Gordon, leading member of the UNIA ACR in Chicago. Um, she eventually forms her own organization, the Peace Movement of Ethiopia. Then you have Queen Mother uh, Moore, Queen Mother Audley Moore, one of the more prominent names associated with the UNIA ACR um, and was a key reparations activist following um, the passing of uh, Papa Garvey himself also, yeah? Lifelong Garvey, I joined the movement as, as a teenager and died at 90 something years, I think 97 years old, still on the ting, yeah? Still on the ting. Then you have Mama Louise Little, who was a leading member of um, the UNIA ACL in Omaha, Nebraska. Mama Louise Little is the mother of Omawale Malcolm X, Kings and Queens, okay? And then you have Mama, Madam Mamie Demina also, who was um, a student of uh, Lady Henrietta Vinton Davis and another leading member of the UNIA ACL. And so oftentimes, yeah, well, getting back to the point I was making earlier, the names um, Mariam Samad and Queen Mother Moore um, and Henrietta Vinton Davis and Mitty Maud Lena Gordon are often more prominent than a lot of the names of the other men in the organization. Like you, you would know Queen Mother Moore before you know um, um, Ulysses and Robert L. Poston, for example, yeah? You, you would know Madame Demina uh, before you know the name Eli Garcia, yeah, for example, yeah? So I'm just saying that it's, it appears to me that the more prominent names associated with the UNIA ACL, other than Mark Mazai Garvey himself, are the women in the organization. The, the, organ the UNIA ACL also instituted women leadership. Every branch was supposed was supposed to have a lady president. So it was instituted within the constitution of the UNIA that every branch must have a lady president. Um, the, the organization was founded um, with a, a women's division, yes, that was uh, led by um, Eva Aud sorry, Aldridge, yeah, Aldridge um, in Jamaica, okay? 
So from, from the inception of the organization, there was a women's division, yes? And so women leadership was being cultivated. More on that a little bit uh, later on, all right? A quote from Mama Amy Jakes Garvey, taken from the Negro world in 1925. Women of all climes and races have as great a part to play in the development of their particular group as the men. Women as leaders, nationally and racially, be not discouraged, um, women of the world, but push forward regardless of the lack of appreciation shown you. A race must be saved. A country must be redeemed. And unless you strengthen the leadership of vacillating Negro men, we will remain marking time until the yellow race gains the leadership of the world and we uh, be forced to subservience under them or extermination. Yeah. And so Mama Amy J. Garvey is pricking the men and telling, yo, listen, what if we fix up? And she's calling the women to leadership uh, in, in the face of vacillating Negro men. Yeah. And some will consider this to be anti male I don't consider it to be anti male She's saying we must take up the role beside the men and correct the man them when they're vacillate. Yeah. African women have done this throughout history. Yes. Look a little, little bit before she said this. Um, um, Queen Mama, yeah, Santa, I said the thing, the same thing. If you, the men of the Ashanti, will not get up and fight the white man, we, the women, will. And she got up and did it, kings and queens. All right. And so, yeah, man, we, we want to affirm Mama, uh, Queen Mama Amy Jakes Garvey with this particular statement right here. Um, and you can read that whole article in Women and the Garvey Movement that I mentioned earlier. She goes on, we are tired of hearing Negro men say there is a better day coming while they do nothing to usher in the day. We are becoming so impatient that we are getting in the front ranks to serve Negro leaders and serve Negro leaders. And with prayer on our lips and arms prepared for any fray, we will press on and on until victory is ours. Africa must be for Africans. The ne and Negroes everywhere must be independent. God being our helper and our guide. Mr. Black Man, watch your step. Ethiopia's queens will reign again and her Amazons protect her shores and people. Strengthen your shaking knees and move forward or we will displace you and lead to victory and to glory. Harsh, isn't it? <laughs> You get me? Levels to the thing, yeah? And so we don't put this forward to say that, that, that things were perfect in terms of gender relations in the UNIA, but things were certainly institutionalized in the sense that the women had role and position and leadership and were able to speak and were able to correct and challenge the brothers in relation to the liberation of Africa and African people. Notice that the goal that Mama Amy Jakes is affirming here is solid, it's clear, it's crystal clear. It is not integration or assimilation into the system. It is not more black women represented within the institutions of the Western world. She's talking about challenging us as African men in relation to fulfilling the liberation of Africa and African people. It's clear. Yes? And if we don't step up and do our thing properly in the way that we're supposed to, then our women will take our place to fulfill that mission. Yeah, man, I can affirm that. I can affirm that, kings and queens. Love it. Yeah. And so I want to affirm that the, the, the women of the African nationalist movement, the black nationalist movement, have always been prominent and have always been strong. And oftentimes they're ignored. Yes, especially by schools of thought that are not black nationalists, that are not pan-Africanists and are hostile to it. OK, so shout out to all of my black nationalist pan-Africanist revolutionary women out there. I and I see you know. All right. OK, kings and queens, going forward, we're just going through the essentials and the fundamentals now, you know. This is what the UNIA was dealing with and is dealing with. All right. Then now we have the, the Negro World newspaper, which was the primary propaganda arm of the UNIA ACL. Check it out, kings and queens. Yeah. Um, these were some of the headlines. Africa, the land of hope and promise for the Negro peoples of the world. Will Negroes allow whites to take Africa? A new Negro steamship company secures first ship for Africa. Yeah. Um, and now you have this article, Awaken Africa, Star Towards the, the, the World. This article is important. It was 1923 that this was published in April. Yes. 
uh, and this was a weekly newspaper. The, the Negro World printed 200,000 copies a week, yes? And that was going around the world, yeah? So throughout the Americas, Caribbean, South and Central America, the, throughout the United States, Canada, yes, throughout Europe, yeah, Negro World made it to Australia. In fact, there was a branch of the UNIA ACL in Australia. Yes, it also made it to the African continent. And the colonial governments banned the Negro World newspaper. Yeah, colonial governments banned the Negro World newspaper. In places like Zimbabwe, what was then Rhodesia, you could be imprisoned for life. And in some other places, um, you could be sentenced to death for being found with a page of the Negro World. But what happened was the, the UNIA had, and the, the, the Universal African Legion, another one of their roles, because a lot of them were seamen. Coming out of World War I, there were a lot of trained seamen among Africans, uh, especially in America. And so the UNIA ACL had a network of seamen that would smuggle the newspaper onto ships and drop it off in Costa Rica and Panama and Trinidad uh, and Brazil um, and Cuba and South Africa and Nigeria and Congo and Britain and France, yeah? And all them place there, yeah? And what would happen, they, they, they developed a thing that was called drum wireless, yes? And the article that you see on, the, on, on your right is speaking about drum wireless, yeah? Um, I'll, I'll read the first paragraph. It says, news has reached us um, of the wonderful success of the propaganda of the Universal Negro Improvement Association in the motherland Africa. The natives of the old home are using every available means to, discriminate, to disseminate the aims and objectives of our association throughout the length and breadth of the continent even though the colonial bulldogs have been trying to hound them into subjection. Um, boomerang for colonial powers. That's the headline. That's the, the, the subheading. Yeah. The colonial powers in Africa thought that they could have easily suppressed the work of the Universal Negro Improvement Association by prohibiting the circulation of our newspaper, The Negro World. But they have come to, the reali to, re to realize that their are more ways than one to kill a dog than putting a rope around its neck, his neck. Now, I, I love the symbolism here, you know, because we've already set up the colonial bulldog, yes? Um, and so so they've, they've come in with the newspaper, they've banned the newspaper, but Ligo Rowe said that the colonial powers have now realised, yes, that there, there is more than one way to kill a dog than putting a rope around his neck. I love the symbolism, kings and queens. What we can achieve through... Uh, circulation of the Negro world in Africa, surely other means will be adopted for doing so and now find that the natives are broadcasting the new doctrine of Negro liberty, Negro freedom, emancipation, and true democracy by drum wireless. What's this drum wireless that we're talking about? What used to happen is that places like Zimbabwe and other places and Kenya, Africans on the continent used to gather and maybe because the, the Negro one was printed in three different languages. So you had sections in English, Spanish, and French, which were the three primary colonial languages of the, of the time. Yeah. And so um, a person who could read the colonial language would read the article and translate it into the language of the people them. Yes. And then there will be designated people who are responsible for disseminating, memorizing the message and disseminating it around the city, the village, the community, in the people, them language. I don't know if I hear me say. Yeah? Now notice, yeah, because that, the term drum wireless could sound very modern, right? You know what I'm saying? Very, very serious thing. Yeah? And so in, a, in, in, in Zimbabwe, a man um, was actually, there was a big protest because a man was imprisoned for being found with copies of, of, the, of the Negro world. And the people them kicked out so much fuss that the colonial government in Zimbabwe um, what was then called Radisha, had to release the man, yeah? Uh, kings and queens, yeah? So mad thing, yeah? Again, primary principle thing. And I'm also developing a presentation on this as well, looking at how the UNIA mastered the media of its time. Because the UNIA was developing a radio station 
um, and radio was a relatively cutting edge technology at the time. And it was talking, it was getting into, because they used to film some of the Liberty Hall and the convention. And so some of the snippets from, from the conventions were played at Liberty Hall. So they were getting into cinema. Yeah, the moving, in, the moving image kings and queens. All right. Um, yeah, man. Very, very serious thing. Okay. Um, right, kings and queens. The uh, Now we get to the international convention. What time is it? Okay, I'm going to speak for another 15 minutes. 20 minutes, yeah? No, actually, it's going to be a bit, a bit longer than that. Stay tuned, all right? Then we're going to open up for Q&A and discussion. So the International Convention of the Negro Peoples of the World, which we are celebrating this year, Kings and Queens, the 100th year anniversary, all right? Um, won't go too much into it because during the month of Messiah, we're going to be delving into that. So I'm just going to touch on it, yeah? Um, so we're talking about 25,000 African people from around the world, and I do mean around the world. Um, Africans from the continent were there. Africans from all over the Americas were there. Um, Africans from Europe were there, okay? Um, Mark of Messiah Garvey was elected as the provisional president of the United States of Africa as a part of a government in exile. And I've emphasized this because there are documentaries out there and um, people that write books that say that Marcus Messiah Garvey appointed himself. This is false. It's incorrect. There was a brother from Nigeria by the name of D. Lewis, I believe. Forgive me if I've got that wrong, yeah? And I've never been able to find out what his first name was. I've only ever seen it as D, yes? Um, that ran also for the position of provisional president, but Mark Mazai Garvey won the election. Um, and so, um, so, but again, as a part of a government in exile. So the point is that in 1884, 1885, European nations sat around a table and carved up the continent for the purpose of colonization, and they eventually colonized it. So the Africans now are saying, well, this is illegitimate leadership. This is an illegitimate government. And so we are now developing a government in exile. Yes? For the purpose of liberating African people. Okay? And so um, a, a, a potentate, yes? A supreme potentate was also appointed uh, above as a ceremonial head, head above the president general. But the, the, according to the constitution, the, the potentate had to reside on the African continent, yeah? Okay? And so the first potentate was from uh, Liberia, and his name was George O'Mark, yes? And then there was another potentate from Sierra Leone later on, whose name is slipping me at the moment, forgive me. Okay? So there are two great feats coming out of the, 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 the International Convention of 1921, was this, the election of this government in exile, and the second was the Declaration of Rights of the Negro Peoples of the World, which is a monumental document, yeah, um, that was basically d d presenting before the world, yes, all of the things that African people are facing and then now declaring the rights, yes, that we are demanding from the world uh, as a result. A few snippets from the Declaration of Rights. The preamble says, be it resolved that the Negro people of the world through their chosen representatives in convention assembled in Liberty Hall in the city of New York and the United States of America on the 1st of August 9th, um, sorry, sorry, from August the 1st to August the 31st in the year of our Lord, 1,000, um, sorry, 1,920 protest against the wrongs and injustices they are suffering at the hands of their white brethren and state what they deem their fair and just rights as well as the treatment they propose to demand of all men in the future in order to encourage our race all over the world and to stimulate it to overcome the handicaps and difficulties surrounding it and to push forward to a higher and grander destiny, we demand and insist on the following declaration of rights. And I haven't numbered them because I haven't put them in sequential order. So this, these are just the, well, I have numbered them. All right. Um, be it known that all, be it known to all men that whereas all men are created equal and entitled to the rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and because of this, we, the duly, the duly elected representatives of the Negro peoples of the world, invoking the aid of the just and almighty God, do declare all men, women, and children of our blood throughout the world free denizens, and do can claim them as free citizens of Africa. What am I saying? Free citizens of Africa, the motherland of all Negroes, yes? Two, 
that we believe in the supreme authority of our race in all things racial, that all things are created and given to man as a common possession, that there should be an equitable distribution. Notice the use of that word, equitable distribution. Mm. And apportionment of all such things and in consideration of the fact that, that as a race, we are now deprived of those things that, we, that are normally and legally ours. We believe it right that all such things should be acquired and held by whatsoever means possible, by any means necessary. Seven, we believe that any law or practice that tends to deprive any African of his land or privileges the free uh, sorry all the privileges of free citizenship within his country is unjust and immoral and no native should respect any such law or practice yeah bearing in mind that africa is under colonialism at this point we are not bound to respect colonial laws 15 we strongly condemn the cupidity of those nations of the world who by open aggression or secret schemes have seized the territories and inexhaustible natural wealth of Africa. And we place on record our most solemn determination to reclaim the treasures and possession and, um, and sorry, of the vast continent of our forefathers. 29, with the help of the almighty God, we declare ourselves the sworn protectors of the honor and virtue of our women and children and pledge our lives for their protection and defense everywhere and under all circumstances from wrongs and outrages this is number 29 you know this is actually a, a, a point in the declaration of rights of the negro peoples of the world that we as african men declare ourselves the sworn protectors of the honor and virtue of our women and children Oh, I know that. All right. And finally, for, the, for this section, um, 39, that the colors, the red, black, and green be the colors of the Negro race. 40, resolved that the, Ethi the, the anthem, Ethiopia, the land of our fathers, shall be the anthem of the Negro race. Ethiopia, the land of our fathers. Thou land where the gods love to be, as storm clouds at night suddenly gather, our armies come rushing to thee. We must in the fight be victorious, as swords are outward to gleam. For us will the victory be glorious when led by the red, black, and green. Advance, advance to victory. Let Africa be free. Advance to meet the foe. Advance to meet the foe with the might of the red, the black, and the green. With the might of the red, the black, and the green. Yes, indeed, kings and queens. That's the universal e Ethiopian uh, anthem. The first verse, as written uh, by J. Arnold Ford of the UNIA ACL, kings and queens. Next week, we're going to go into that a little bit more. So do stay tuned. I might even sing it for you. How about that? All right. So this is why we're, we're celebrating this year, kings and queens. It, that's why it's RBG at 100. The 13th day of August, Messiah is when the flag of the red, black, and green was designated the flag of nations for African people, the liberation flag, okay? 100 years, kings and queens, the centenary of the RBG. Um, I'm going to skip this for the sake of time and come back to it later. Yes? Um, so let me just deal with this quickly. Um, so in, in the 1920s, the UNIA ACL also initiated uh, an, an African development program, yeah? 1921, they sent a delegation um the first delegation to liberia yes um 1922 a second delegation okay um then now in 1924 because um liberia if you know anything about liberia you know that it was really since its inception um a satellite of the american government and the american that the government in liberia was really responding to the demands of the government in uh, the united states of america and so in 1924 the the the, the u.s government sent um, W.E.B. Du Bois um, to uh, basically whisper in the ears of President King of Liberia uh, on behalf of the American government, yeah? Um, but in 1924, um, the UNIA, as a part of a $2 million industrial development program, sent $50,000 worth of industrial, agricultural and industrial 
development equipment uh, to Liberia um, in 1924. When they landed, however, they were the, the, the goods were confiscated. Yes, by the Liberian government, the um, the, the 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 delegation was not allowed to disembark uh, the ship. Yes, now the, the they sent a delegation in 1922, um, and that delegation was led by Mama Henrietta Vinton Davis. Yeah. The one in 1924 was led by Robert L. Poston. Yes, one of the leading members. He was, uh, I believe, the first assistant president general. Um, and uh, he actually died of pneumonia on the way back from Liberia in 1924. He was married at the time to an, a great African woman by the name of Augusta Savage. Yes, um, uh, who we'll go into later on. Uh, but I'm 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 always touched by that story that you know the man led this delegation, they they, they you know the all the fifty thousand dollars worth of equipment that they bought they were seized by the government yeah um they were not allowed to disembark the land that they that that the UNIA bought yeah they were not allowed to to visit that land um and the brother who led the delegation dies on the way back yes uh Robert L. Poston um from um Liberia from of pneumonia and um. I'm I'm impassioned by the, the, the fact that, that more more work needs to be done on eliminating um, the works of Robert L. Poston and Ulysses Poston, those brothers, if it can if 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 it is indeed possible to do so. Yeah. So in in saying all that, Kings and Queens, we have to deal with the enemies um, of Marcus Mosiah Garvey, okay, and the UNIA ACL. So we we can break down the enemies into four different categories. Firstly. Um, um, the, 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 the European imperialists, i.e. Britain, America, France and Spain in particular, uh, but all of them to, 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 to some degree or another, um, communists and socialists, and that is communists and socialists of the Europeans and the Africans. Um, yeah. Um, so that's namely the communist international and the black communist movement, principally in the United States of America. The integrationists, which are the NAACP, who are principal among them, uh, the FBI, um, who sent agents, the first black FBI agent was, um, um, sorry, so then it wasn't the FBI, it was the Bureau of Investigations, it wasn't the, the Federal Bureau of Investigations at the time, and they also sent police informants, yeah, um, into the UNIA ACL, so you have Stanley Baldwin, who was the, 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 the Prime Minister of um, the UK throughout the majority of the 1920s, um, then you have um, J. Edgar Hoover, who comes to the fore, yes, as in, in the Bureau of Investigation, trying to infiltrate the, the Marcus Garvey movement and find a justification for him to be deported. Um, there was also a, a plot to assassinate him uh, uh, by the, U the New York Police Department. Then you have Warren G. Harding, who was the president of um, America during that time. And unfortunately, we have to deal with the fact that many black activists uh, of that era were also very, very anti-Garvey to the point of sabotage, yes? Uh, and so in that regard, we're dealing with people like Chandler Owen, yeah, who was one of those who, um, you know, petitioned the American government and led a, a movement called the Garvey Must Go campaign. Yes, uh, a, a, along with A. Philip Randolph and others. And then you have uh, W.E.B. Du Bois, who um, I'll, I'll, I'll explain something about him in a second. Uh, and then you have um, George Padmore, who <laughs> him and um, C.L.R. James used to heckle Marcus Mazai Garvey in London when he was trying to deliver speeches and, you know, throw... <laughs> Throw stone at him and them kind of things there. All right. And so some of these people are, have otherwise made uh, significant contributions. However, when it came to Malcolm Azai Garvey and the UNIA ACL, they were very, very disruptive. Yeah. Um, in many different ways uh, for various different reasons. And so it's, it, it's also important to note that communism and capitalism are opposites. Yeah. In the European, uh, you know, spectrum of political advocacy. All right. But Many, many times, yeah, you'll find that the communists and the capitalists, yeah, would unify in, in against in a, in a unified effort against the Garvey movement, yeah. Time doesn't allow to go into that fully, um, but just note that for future reference, okay? All right. So, quoting from Race First, the ideological and organizational struggles of Michael Mazai Garvey and the Universal Negro Improvement Association, Baba Tony Martin informs us it was in this spirit, same spirit that the British authorities reacted. When in 1923, Garvey reduced them to a state of consternation by announcing his intention to undertake a world tour to defend his reputation. 
governors of West, East and Central African colonies all agreed to prohibit him entry should he should he attempt to land in their areas. And they prepared to draft special legislation to meet this contingency. Such Garvey induced legislation. Yes, listen, the undesirable persons prevention of immigration ordinance of 1924. This is an actual act that the colonial governments signed and agreed upon just to keep Mark of Mazai Garvey out of Africa. Yes. Um, actually came into being in Sierra Leone. It bore the, the, the ingenious subtitle and ordi an ordinance to prevent um, certain descriptions of persons from entering Sierra Leone. Shipping companies were also alerted to refuse passage uh, to Garvey and his party should he attempt to sell to Africa. So this is the answer. When people say, why didn't Marcus Messiah Garvey go to Africa? Now you have uh, at least part of your answer. Yes, there was laws in place. Yes, from governments and even shipping companies not to make it happen, which is why people were sent on behalf of the UNIA ACL and Garvey did not necessarily go um, himself during the 1920s when the UNIA was at its most powerful. Okay? If anything, the French colonial authorities reacted with even greater hysteria to the UNIA presence than the British, than the British, and their information more frequently tended to be garbled. The governor general of French West Africa was in 1921 convinced that the UNIA planned to massacre all the whites in the Gold Coast and uh, sorry, as a preliminary uh, to a general uprising, which would be financed from America. This is what the colonial authorities were fearing at the time. Yes. Um, yet another. All right. So and it's also to note that in, in places like the Congo, the Negro world. Yeah. Um, by the Belgium authorities in the Congo was was actually um, identified as the cause of uprisings, yes? Um, some of which were led by Mfumo Kabangu, yes? In the 1920s in the Congo. But the Negro world was identified by the colonial authorities, yes? Um, in the Congo as one of the reasons for the uprising in the Congo, okay? All right. Um, now we're gonna deal with um, W.E.B. Du Bois. Um, very, very celebrated among in Pan-African circles, but. Um, very heavily questioned. That celebration is heavily questioned by Garveyites. And so the, here's the context as to why, because a lot of people don't actually know this, yeah? Um, as Ray's first, um, Baba Tony Martin tells us, yet another factor in Garvey's Liberian failure um, is the possible role of his rival, W.E.B. Du Bois. Upon learning in the late um, 1923 that Du Bois was bound for Liberia, William H. Lewis, a black Boston attorney and former assistant attorney, general suggested to President Coolidge that it would be a, a very graceful thing and help the United States Liberia relations if Du Bois could be appointed a special representative to King's forthcoming second inauguration. Du Bois misguidedly uh, exalted uh, in this of official quote gesture of courtesy, one so unusual that it was um, epochal, the highest rank ever given by any country to a diplomatic agent in Black Africa. So Dubois was celebrating his role as an agent of the American government uh, in Black Africa. Uh, Baba Tony Martin goes on. The 99 year, so basically, as I, as I explained before, yes, um, when the UNIA landed in, in Liberia in, 1990, in 1924, the, the goods were seized, yes, um, and they had bought land, yes. Um, in Liberia. What happened to the land that the UNIA bought in Liberia? Right? Listen, the 99-year lease by Liberia of, of a million acres to uh, the Firestone Rubber Tire Company of Akron, Ohio, um, uh, added yet another possible explanation for the repudiation of Garvey's scheme. Yeah? Now, bearing in mind that the UNIA have been in liaison with the Liberian government throughout this whole process. And they were given certain assurances and them kind of things there. It all fell apart um, in 1924 for a number of different reasons. Um, and so, and um, um, at the same time, the American government was looking to secure its interests and was doing so through American corporations, such as the Firestone Rubber Company. 
Continuing, President King, with encouragement from Dubois, was making up his mind to grant Firestone the land at about the same time he was rudely thwarting Garvey's aspirations. Um, so the land that was given, that, that the UNIA bought, was eventually given to the Firestone Rubber Company at the ridiculous price of like, it was some dirt cheap money. Why ten cents an acre in my in, in in my head? And I could be wrong on that, so I'm not gonna don't don't quote me on that. Yeah, but it was ridiculously like it, he may as well have given it to me for free. Yes, um, the Bois' role in the rubber deal seems to have been fairly intimate. In January 1924, he had accompanied the United States Minister Solomon Porter Hood and 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 the Firestone rubber expert on a trip to Liberia's rubber lands to ascertain whether Firestone should invest in the area. And in 1925, he sought to capitalize on this by asking Harry, Harvey Firestone to include blacks among his company's supervisory personnel in Liberia. All he got was a meaningless reply from the company promising nothing. Yeah? So... Right. So, kings and queens. Yeah? Now, bear this in mind. A lot of the rubber... Yes, that um, that um, Firestone was mining out of Liberia was sold to the Ford Car Company. Yes, and the Ford family and the Firestone family are now united. Yeah, one of the the, the, the granddaughter of uh, sorry the um the granddaughter of um, Firestone is married to the grandson of Ford. Yeah. And she owns an NFL team. I forget which team. Yeah. Owns an NFL team, Kings and Queens. So you see how the development of uh, neocolonialism in Africa. Yes, because very in mind that the Firestone Rubber Company now goes on to influence uh, the Liberian government and have position in its um, or petition for position in its cabinet, the government cabinet and all kinds of different things. Okay. So this bearing this in mind, let's put in um, the, 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 the Garveyite criticism of the Bois uh, into context. Yeah. Meanwhile, in, that, in the, the 1924 UNIA convention warned that a Firestone concession would ultimately mean, quote, usurpation of the government, even as has been done with the Black Republic of Haiti after similar white companies entered there under the pretense of developing the country. This warning may have contributed to Liberian hostility when Firestone offered a five million loan in exchange for the right to appoint 22 officials to run Liberia's financial, military and native affairs. The UNIA, yes, was cautioning our people about the ills of neocolonialism as early as 1924. We had seen it take place in Haiti. Yes when the American government went there with its corporations. So before even the end of colonialism as a formal institution, the UNIA was identifying neocolonialism, as in colonialism through the commandeering of the economy of our nations. Moving very quickly. Um, I'll skip this for the sake of time. And just get to um, the... The, the 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 philosophical foundation for all this work yeah so <clears throat> um the ideology of garveyism is often referred to as african fundamentalism in fact Marco mazai garvey himself referred to the philosophy as african fundamentalism we identify four primary um essential principles of african fundamentalism race first self-reliance nationhood and african spiritual orthodoxy the first three were identified by baba tony martin the fourth was des was un was was extrapolated from the teachings of Malcolm Isaiah Garvey by Brother Lida Badlaka, my father, based upon the fact that spirituality was central to the Garvey philosophy and ideology. To explain these principles, race first. In the world of wolves, quoting Malcolm Isaiah Garvey now, one should go armed. And one of the most powerful defensive weapons within the reach of African people is the practice of race first. In all parts of the world, yes, put your race first like all other races do. Okay? Simple things. We are oppressed as a race. Let's organize as a race to deliberate ourselves. All right. 
essential principle number two, self-reliance. Power is the only argument that satisfies man. Except the individual, the nation, the race has power that is exclusive. That individual, nation or race will be bound by the will of others who possess these great qualifications. Hence, it is advisable for the Negro to get power of every kind. Power in education, power in science, power in industry, power in politics, power in higher government. That kind of power that will stand out so that other races and nations will see if not seen. Nationhood. No race is free until it has a nation of its, a strong nation of its own, its own system of government and its own order of society. Never give up this idea. Never be satisfied to always live under the government of other people because you will always be at their mercy. Visualize for yourself and your children and generations unborn, your own kings, emperors, presidents, your own government officials and administrators who look like you. We are determined to solve our own problems by redeeming our motherland Africa from the hands of alien exploiters and found there a government, a nation of our own, strong enough to lend protection to the members of our race scattered all over the world and to compel the respect of the nations and races of the earth. I'm going to go back a, a little piece because I should really read this, yeah? Um, in terms of the, the fact that the UNIA ACL program was essentially built upon the, found, the, the foundation of uh, nation building, sorry, institution building, yes, for the sake of nation building. And Papa Garvey says, it is necessary for the Negro to pay close attention to developing an, a, the appreciation for institutional life. It is incumbent upon him that he also have and control his own institutions based upon his own cultural and civilized idealism. As for instance, he may have his own church, but it is not necessary for him to adopt the, the peculiar articles of faith of the churches of alien races. He is not a Hebrew, therefore he will not adopt the Hebrew faith. He is not a Roman, he is not, not by origin, sorry, a Roman Catholic, nor an Anglican, because these faiths and religions were founded by white men with an idea of their own. His universities, Colleges and schools may engage in the same process of education, but with an adopted curriculum necessary for the special benefit of the African, with the absolute objective of attaining the end uh, that is particularly desired by the race. And so that's why you see, um, as Baba John Henry Clark says, no people rise and fall within the context of institutions. So if you want to liberate yourself, you have to build institutions of liberation. Black Cross nurses, African legionnaires, Universal Motor Corps, um, uh, 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 Negro Factories Corporation, um, uh, Black Star Line, and so on and so on and so on and so forth, kings and queens, all right? Finally, for essential principles, African spiritual orthodoxy. Let's go into it. If the white man has the idea of a white god, let him worship his god as he desires. If the yellow man's god is of his race, let him worship his God as he sees fit. The God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. Let him exist for the race who believes in the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. We Negroes believe in the God of Ethiopia, the everlasting God. The God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost, the one God of all ages. That is the God in whom we believe and we shall worship God through the spectacles of Ethiopia. So we emphasize that Mark of Messiah Garvey was inspiring us as a people to develop an African-centered understanding of God, spirituality, and religion. Yes? He goes, he goes further. It is, um, oh, sorry. And by the way, so this is, in again, in the course of African philosophy as how the message to the people. Um, and I'm repeating what I just read a minute ago, but with a, with a brief... Um, um, to reinforce, yeah, the idea that we must have our own institutions, as for instance, he may have his own church, but it is not necessary for him to adopt the peculiar, peculiar articles of faith of the churches of alien races. He is not a Hebrew, etc., etc. In his religious philosophy, yes, the African may selfly adopt articles of faith to link him with the Godhead of the Christian faith and practice such as his particular religion, and so likewise all other institutions. God is God. 
Yeah, there is no different God for every all the different um uh 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 spiritual faiths and religions. There's one God, but what is the difference is the the the, the, the culture and civilized idealisms through which the understanding of that God is expressed, i.e., religion. Okay. To emphasize the point a little bit further, Mama Amy J. Garvey in Garvey and Garveyism says. The wearing of the uniforms and robes of office by the by the Garveyites had a deep uh, significance and psychological effect. Had Garvey landed in Africa, he would have discarded the uniform of the European and European attire for tribal gowns to become a part of the masses and thus impress them while satisfying his inner longing for Africanization. We're not going to explain it further. But we're going to leave it to speak for itself so we can wrap up. Finally, kings and queens. Yeah, just some primary suggestions of reading for um garvey scholarship yes essentially the philosophies and opinions of 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 um, marcus garvey uh, volumes one and two as well as more philosophies and opinions of of marcus garvey which is very difficult to get yeah um because it's strictly speaking not in print but um i do have a copy somewhere about the place a little bit later on i'll show it to you and show off uh, a little bit kings and queens all right oh i know where it is hold on ah oh, here we go so this is marcus garvey here that i mentioned earlier i'm gonna come back to that and then you have more philosophies and opinions of marcus garvey difficult to get but get it if you can um it, especially because this book ha houses a lot of speeches of marcus garvey post 1924 up until 1940 when he passed away and it also goes in on his program uh, in jamaica not a lot of people know about this program in Jamaica. It isn't a, this presentation, but I've skipped it for the sake of time. If you want me to deal with it, I'll say about it in, in the Q&A and uh, we'll come back to it. Then there's Garvey and Garveyism, yeah, um, which is a very, very um, important book as well. It's actually Mama Amy Dix Garvey's personal memoir um, of the Garvey movement. Then now you have Baba Tony Martin, uh, who has written peer books, yeah, but just a few for, to get you started. Race First, which is the essential one, really. Then there's Marcus Garvey Hero, which is a condensed version. You can read it in a day, but it gives a very, very good overview um, of um, the, the UNIA ACL and Marcus Gar Garvey himself. And then you have Message to the People, which houses um, the course of African philosophy, yeah? Um, just quickly to explain, all of these movements and organizations were inspired by Marcus Mazai Garvey in one, in one way, shape or form. A couple of those that I'm missing, um, um, is Kwame Ture um, and the Black Power Movement of the 1960s. Um, just to say that um, El, uh, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad was a member of the UNIA ACL in Detroit. Um, we all know that Marcus Mazai Garvey, sorry, Marcus, Ma Amwali Malcolm X's parents were Garveyites. F Farrakhan's father was a Garveyite. Mr. Farrakhan's father was a Garveyite. And as he says, his mother was on the fringes of Garveyism. Uh, and Krumah, we know, um, was um, was um, said that the book that fired his enthusiasm the most was the philosophies and opinions of Marcus Mazai Garvey. The ANC um, in Azania, South Africa, um, that uh, Mama Queen of uh, Namzamu Madikizela, Winnie Mandela, uh, became a member of, was actually founded in part by Garvey at uh, uh, Khalid Mohammed post um, in his iteration as the head of the... Um, New Black Panther Party became a fierce Garveyite. Rastafari was founded by Garveyites, kings and queens. Leonard Howell was a member of the of the UNIA in New York and also um, in Jamaica. All right. Finally, this course of African philosophy is actually the course that Marcus Mazai Garvey began in 1937, where he was teaching his the, the next cadre of leadership. The UNIA was going through a lot of strife and tribulation, and so Marcus Mazai Garvey wanted to train personally. Uh, leadership. So in, in um, 1937, he developed the course of African philosophy and went to Canada, yes, um, to teach it. And these are the, um, eight of the 10 um, uh, graduates of the first school of African philosophy. Um, and as you can see, kings and queens, four of them are men and four of them are women. Yeah. Um, in the second school, um, you have the names. Um, there, so there were seven people in the second school. Four were in the United States of America, uh, with one each from Nigeria, Uganda, and South Africa. They were Benjamin W. Jones of Philadelphia, J.O. Uh, uh, Unwan Nolue, sorry, Unwan Nolue of Onitsha, Nigeria, Mrs. H.T. 
uh, McNary of Detroit, D.S. Mosoke of Kampala, Uganda, Mrs. Ketura Paul of New York City, and H. Uh, Ilitincho of Cape Province, South Africa, and Mrs. E. M. Collins of uh, New York City. So as you can see, four, um, sorry, three of the four from the United States were women again. And we don't know what the genders of those from the continent were because they, there's no, yeah, the names don't necessarily suggest gender. Um, but again, Papa Garvey was um, investing in women leadership, yeah, um, in um, the UNIA as well, okay? Um, right, so this, these are the, the names of all of the president generals from Marcus Mazai Garvey to now. Um, it's important that we note that the UNIA ACL still exists, yes, today. People talk as though the UNIA folded after the death, the deportation of Marcus Mazai Garvey from the United States of America and his passing in 1940. It's not true. There have been many, many problems, but there's an unbroken line of leadership from Papa Garvey until now. The current president general uh, is uh, Baba Akili uh, Nkrumah. And this is a picture of my father, Avalina Bandaka, who is also the, um, the, U the UNIA ACL ambassador to the UK um, at this time, sorry, in, in um, 2014, I believe this picture was taken. And this is the 10th president general, yes, Baba Senghor Jawale Baye, okay, who presided over the inauguration of two UNIA chapters in the UK, all right, during that time. Last and finally, kings and queens, we end with the words of Mama Amy Dates Garvey, as spoken in More Philosophies and Opinions of Mark Messiah Garvey. Garveyism is not a theoretical philosophy, but a working idealism geared to the crying needs of an entire race. Yeah, so we're emphasizing the fact that we're dealing with a, a working idealism. The ideal being a free and redeemed Africa and all African people. And so we work, we, we, it's not an abstract theory. It's a working idealism that we are still in the process of shaping, still in the process of actualizing kings and queens. Okay, and with that, we just affirm, Gavi lives, Messiah lives. <laughs>